Cambridge IGCSE October November 2021 Paper 062521 Question 1 Which instrument is most suitable for the measuring the thickness of a single sheet of paper? So the screw gauge is an instrument used for measuring exactly the diameter of a thin wire or the width of a sheet of a paper. Therefore, the correct answer is option D, micrometer, micrometer screw gauge. Option D is correct. Question 2. The diagram shows distance diagrams for four objects. Which graph represents an object moving with an increasing speed? So, we are provided with a distance time graph and we have to identify which graph shows the motion of an object which is moving with an increasing speed so increasing speed means the object is accelerating so let's look at each options option a we can see the distance remains same that means the object is not moving that's why its distance is not increasing or decreasing so this graph represents a an object which is not moving let's look at option B here we can see it's a straight line that means it's increasing the distance uniformly so that the object must be moving with a uniform speed that's why the object could cover the uniform distance in uniform interval of time so the second graph is for a uniform motion let's look at option C so here we can uh, consider equal time intervals you can use a ruler and equal distance away some points you can mark so at equal time interval we can see what happens to the distance covered for that we can extend the graph on its y-axis so we can see you can take a ruler again So if you extend you can see that at equal time interval the distance covered is not equal which is reducing. So we can understand at the end of the journey at same time it is covering less distance. So it is a decelerated motion. In the same way we can check option D graph. So first we have to divide equal interval of time you can use ruler again and you have to extend this on y axis so we can see what is happening to the y axis value so we can extend these time intervals to y axis so we can see how the distance changes. So therefore we can see that for the equal time interval on y axis which represent distance initially it covers less distance then the distance increases that means the speed increase for every time interval so that it is a it must be an accelerated motion. So these are the different types of graphs given in the different options. And we need to find out increasing speed. So increasing speed means accelerating motion, accelerated motion. So the correct answer is option D. Option C represents a decreasing speed motion. Option B represents a uniform motion. And option A represents speed is zero. Question 3. An object has a weight of 6.4 Newton on the earth where the gravitational field strength is 10 Newton per kg, which row states the mass and the weight of the object on the moon where the gravitational field strength is 1.6 Newton per kg. So in this question, the object weight on earth is given that is 6.4 Newton 
and the gravitational field strength of earth is also given 10 newton per kg and we need to find out on moon what will be the mass of this object and weight of this object. So first of all using these given values we can find out what will be the mass of the object using the equation w is equal to mg so here we have weight and g so we can calculate mass so we can make mass as the subject so we will get mass is weight over gravitational field strength where weight is 6.4 over 10 so we will get 0 0.64 kilogram that means the mass of this object is 0 0.64 kilogram and we need to understand one important thing is mass will remain constant doesn't matter the object is on earth or moon or any other planet the mass will remain constant so mass of this object when it is on moon also it will be 0 0.64 kilogram therefore we have the mass of the object on the moon and gravitational field strength of moon is also given that is 1.6 newton over kg as we have mass and gravitational field strength we can find out weight of the object on moon simply using the equation mass of the object than gravitational field strength of the object on moon so mass is 0 0.64 times gravitational field strength of moon is 1.6 and the answer in two significant figure is 1.0 newton so that will be the weight of the object on the moon and the mass is 0 0.64 and the weight is 1 newton therefore the correct answer is option a question number four which substance in the table has the lowest density so in order to find out the lowest density we can use the equation of density that is density is mass over volume here mass and volume for all these objects are given materials are given so we can find out the density of the substance given in option a that is mass which is 1.2 times volume 1 so we will get 1.2 gram over centimeter cube that is the density of the substance nylon likewise density of the object substance given in option b that is density of cotton which is 1.5 that is the mass over volume is 1 so we will get 1 0.5 gram over centimeter cube then we can find the density of the substance olive oil which is given in option c so the mass is 1.8 over volume is 2 and we will get 0 0.9 gram per centimeter cube finally the density of water which is given in option d is 2 over 2 then we will get 1 gram over centimeter cube now we can compare all these densities and we can identify olive oil has the least density only 0 0.9 therefore the correct answer is option c question 5 a 20 meter long uniform bridge of weight 100 kilo newton is supported at each end by pillars as shown so in this question we have a 20 meter long uniform bridge and which supported at each end by pillars which is also given in the figure the pillars exert forces t1 and t2 on the end of the bridge what are the values of T1 and T2 when the van of weight 24 kilo Newton is on the bridge 5 meter from the left hand pillar. So here T1 and T2 are two upward forces acting on the bridge by these two pillars and 100 kilo Newton is the weight of the bridge which will be acting exactly at the center of the bridge as the bridge is uniform. So it's weight will be distributed equally 
so that the weight of the beds will act exactly at the center downward and the weight of the van is also acting downwards which is only 5 meter away from the left hand pillar that means the distance from the pillar to the van is only 5 meter so these are the information we can we are provided so there are two upward forces t1 and t2 and two downward forces weight of the bridge and weight of the van now we need to calculate t1 and t2 initially we can find the value of t2 so that we should consider the pivot as the pillar first pillar so this point we can consider as the pivot and we can find out the clockwise and anticlockwise moment and we can equalize that so as this bridge is balanced or not moving it's in equilibrium in that case we can understand or we can equate total clockwise moment equal to total anticlockwise moment on that pivot so now we can consider the pivot as the point where tension sorry t1 force acting and let's look at what are the clockwise moment acting on this point and what are the anticlockwise moments acting so here we can see this 24 kilo newton force is acting in a clockwise direction above the pivot likewise the weight of the bridge 100 kilo newton is also acting a clockwise moment but the t2 is acting an anti-clockwise moment about this particular moment now we can check the distance from the pivot to these given forces so the first distance between pivot and 24 kilo newton force is given that is 5 meter so we have the first perpendicular distance from the pivot to 24 kilo newton force is 5 meter likewise weight will exactly acting on the center so the total length of the bridge is 20 meter therefore half of this length to the center will be only 10 meter so that is the next length we have the distance from the pivot to the weight of the bridge that is simply 10 meter and finally the distance from the pivot to the t2 which is the total length of the bridge which is 20 meter so now we have three distances from the pivot for three given forces and now we can find out the total clockwise moment that is the moment due to these two forces we have to add and the moment equation is nothing but force times distance so the moment of van about pivot will be 24 kilo newton where kilo means thousand times the distance from the pivot which is 5 meter plus the moment of the weight of the bridge which is 100 kilo newton so 100 times kilo x thousand we have to multiply times distance from the pivot to this 100 kilo newton which is half of the length of the bridge which is 10 meter so these two are the clockwise moment which must be equal to the anti-clockwise moment and there is only one force causes anti-clockwise that we already discussed the tension 2 so we can equate that so t2 times the distance from the pivot is 20 meter now we can find out t2 so t2 must be equal to whatever the value we have at LHS over 20 because we have to take 20 to the other side of the equation so the 20 will become reach at the denominator and the answer is 56,000 Newton or we can write 56 kilo Newton so t2 value is 56 kilo newton and t2 is 56 only for the option c 
c therefore we don't have to find out t1 because t2 value is 56 which is correct only for the option c therefore the correct answer is option c you can find out the t1 by considering the pivot as at the point on the second pillar or by considering all the forces upward force must be equal to downward force in all that way you can find out t1 also but here we don't have to find because we got t2 as 56 and which is only correct for option c question 6 a spring which obeys hooke's law has an unstretched length of 10 cm a load of 20 newton is suspended from the spring the new length of the spring is 36 cm what is the spring constant k of the spring here we can use the equation hooke's law equation that is force is equal to spring constant times extension where force is given which is 50 newton but extension is not given so we can find out extension that is the new length of the spring minus unstretched length and the new length is 36 centimeter minus unstretched length is 10 centimeter so we will get 26 centimeter is the extension of the spring now we have force an extension so we can find out k in order to find out k we can make k as a subject so the equation will become spring constant k is equal to force over extension where force is 20 newton extension is 26 centimeter we don't have to convert centimeter into meter the reason is in the option also the unit is given in centimeter so no need to convert centimeter into meter Therefore, the answer in 2 figure is 0 0.77. Hence, the correct answer is option B. Question 7. What is the relationship between the impulse acting on an object and the change in momentum of the object? So, here we need to know the relation between impulse and change in momentum. So actually the equation of impulse is nothing but force times time and another important equation is force is equal to mass times acceleration or mass times we can even write the equation of acceleration instead of acceleration that is acceleration is v minus u over t rate of change of velocity or the difference in velocities over time that is acceleration so we have force is m v minus u over t now i am going to take this t to the lhs so we will get force times time is equal to mv minus mu or m times v minus u that was at the rhs and force times time is equal to i can take this m inside the bracket or open the bracket so i will get f times t is equal to mv minus mu so we derived an equation and this is the final equation now look at the lhs force into time what is force into time that is nothing but impulse we already know the equation of impulse if you are writing f into t, we can write f into t is nothing but impulse and we can write impulse. Likewise, look at the RHS of the equation. So, you can see mv minus mu. What is mv minus mu? That is change in momentum. So, instead of mv minus mu, we can write change in momentum. So, this is also very important relation. I'm going to see multiple choice question. This choice one theory question also you need to know the relation. That is impulse is change in momentum. Therefore, the correct answer is option A. Question A. Electrical energy may be obtained from nuclear fission. In which order is the energy transferred in this process? So here we need to know the process of 
how nuclear fission can be used to generate electrical energy. So basically initially we will have nuclear fuel, the materials or substances which has which will be undergo nuclear fission process. When they undergo nuclear fission process it will produce lot of heat energy. So nuclear fuels will produce lots of heat energy and which will connect to the reactor where we will have water. So this heat energy will make the water to boil. So and this boiled water will be ejecting out lot of fast moving high energy water vapors and this water vapors will make the turbine to rotate. So there will be turbine or something which is movable. So when these water vapors heat they are with very fast moving high energy water vapors when they hit the turbine, the turbine rotates. So this mechanical movement or rotation can create electrical energy. So it will connect to the generator and generator will produce electrical energy. Therefore the correct answer is option D. Question 9. A motor of power P exerts a force F on an object. The object moves a distance d during the time t that the force acts. Which equation is used to calculate the time t? So we have an object here and a motor exerts a force f on the object and because of this force the object moves a distance d and the time taken for this is t. So we need to write the equation of T. Here we can start with the equation of power. Power is rate of doing work or work done over time. Where well, what is the equation of work done? Work done is nothing but the force times the distance. So the same equation we can rewrite instead of work done. The equation of work done that is force times distance over time. So now we have an equation power is equal to force times distance over time. Now we can make time as the subject. So we will get time equal to force times distance over power. So here we have just taken time to the electric. So we got an equation of time in terms of force, distance and power. Therefore the correct answer is option D. Question 10. A scientist uses an electric motor to lift a load to a vertical distance of 2 meters. He then increases the input power to the motor and repeat the experiment. The efficiency of the motor does not change. This row correctly describes the effect that this has on the useful work done lifting the load and time taken to lift it. So an electrical motor is using to lift a load through a vertical distance 2 meter. Now we need to know when he increased the input power of the motor. What will be the change in terms of work done and time taken. So the motor has to lift a load to a 2 meter distance. Even though the power of the motor increased still it has to do the same work. It has to lift the same load to the same height so that the work done is not going to change. So work done will stay the same. But what about the time taken? So power increases means what is the equation of power? Work done over time and the power has increased but we have seen in this case work done is still same because the motor has to lift the same load to the same height so that the work then should be same. Now by looking at the equation we can understand in order to increase the power as the work done is not increasing or decreasing the time must be decreased.
or we can use the logic when more power means the work will be doing quickly so that the time will be less so the time taken decreases therefore the correct answer is option b question 11 four containers are filled to the top with the same liquid the base of each container is circular which container has the greatest pressure exerted by the liquid at its base so here the first point given is four containers are filled to the top with the same liquid so here all the containers are filled to the top with the same liquid same liquid means all will have same density the density will be same for the all the liquids in all containers and we need to find out which container has the greatest pressure exerted by the liquid at its base so here we have to look at the equation of the pressure in fluid or liquid which we know that pressure is equal to density of the liquid times gravitational field strength times height and for all these containers as it contains same liquid the density is same and g value gravitational field strength for earth it is 10 so the g value is also same so only by comparing height we can understand which one will have a greater pressure so we can identify when height is more pressure will be more so which container has more height or depth and it, it is very clear that the container a has the greatest height h so that pressure at the bottom of container a will be greater hence the correct answer is option a question 12 a liquid is evaporating the liquid is not boiling which statement about the liquid is correct at an instant in time so in order to answer this question we need to identify understand the difference between evaporation and boiling so here the liquid is evaporating not boiling so we have to identify which statement supports evaporation or explain the property of evaporation not boiling option a says any molecule can escape but for evaporation only the molecule at the surface of the liquid will escape this statement is actually correct for boiling so option a is wrong option b any molecules can escape again yes but only from the liquid surface which is correct but it's not about any molecule only the molecule with highest energy will escape so option b is also wrong half part of the statement in option b is correct but it's not any molecule only the molecule with high energy let's look at option c only molecule with enough energy can escape only from the liquid surface yes that is correct option d says only molecule with enough energy can escape that one is correct but from any part of the liquid no evaporation will happen only at the surface therefore correct answer is option c question 13 the diagram shows two cylinders connected by a narrow tube fitted with a tape fitted with a tap one cylinder contains 80 centimeter cube of gas at a pressure 2 times 10 to the power 5 pascal the other cylinder contains a vacuum the volume of the evacuated cylinder is 20 centimeter cube the tap is open so that the gas can flow to fill both cylinders the temperature of the gas remains constant what is the new pressure of the gas so initially the gas is only filled in the first container so in the initial case its volume is given we can consider it as v1 and corresponding pressure is also given p1 later when the tap open the gas will spread to the second container also so the volume will be different the total volume will be the volume of the first container and volume of the second container and uh, as the, the reason is the gas is now filled in both the containers so the new volume we can consider as v2 is the sum of the 
volume of the first container plus volume of the second container and which is 100 centimeter cube so we have new volume and we need to find out what will be the new pressure so here we can use the equation that is v1 p1 equal to v2 p2 the product of volume and pressure will be always constant from this concept we will get this equation or this is actually the equation of Boyle's law and this is a very important equation not only for multiple choice questions in order to solve theory questions also you need this relation here we have the values v1 p1 and v2 we can substitute that so v1 is 80 times p1 is 2 times 10 to the power 5 which is equal to v2 is 100 times p2 in order to calculate p2 we can make p2 as a subject so p2 is equal to 80 times 2 times 10 to the power 5 over 100 and the answer is 1.6 times 10 to the power 5 pascal therefore option b is correct question 14 an aluminium block has a mass 200 gram the specific heat capacity of aluminium is 900 joule per kg degree celsius how much energy is needed to increase the temperature of the block from 20 degree celsius to 110 degree celsius so in this question mass is given which is 200 gram so when we convert into kilogram which will be 200 times 10 to the power minus 3 kilogram and we have specific heat capacity c value is also given we need to calculate energy required e in order to change the temperature from 110 20 degree to 110 degree celsius so the change in temperature is 110 minus 20 which is 90 degree celsius so here we can use the equation energy required is nothing but mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature their mass is 200 times 10 to the power minus 3 times specific heat capacity is 900 time change in temperature is 90 and the answer is 16200 joule therefore the correct answer is option c question 15 the diagram shows a liquid in glass thermometer which change to the design would result in a more sensitive thermometer here the correct answer is option b increase the volume of the bulb when the volume of bulb increases the sensitivity of the thermometer increase the reason is it can carry a greater volume of liquid in the bulb which increases the expansion of the liquid thread per change in degree celsius in temperature so always by increasing the volume of the bulb we can increase the sensitivity question 16 the diagram shows a pan used for cooking food which row is correct for the materials used to make the base and the handle of the pan so the base of the pan we know that the base of the pan should be a good thermal conductor because it should transfer heat from the fire then only we can cook the food so quickly so the base should make always with a material which should be a good thermal conductor whereas handle which should not let the heat to transfer so always the handle should make with a material which should be a poor thermal conductor so the correct answer is option b base pan should be a good thermal conductor and handle of the pan must be a poor thermal conductor then only we can hold without burning our hand question 17 is from waves the diagram shows a wave in a ripple tank containing water the waves approaches a barrier and passes through the gap in the barrier the size of the gap is about the same as the size of the wavelength of the ripples the gap size is increased 
what happened to the ripple pattern to the right of the barrier so here we can see when these water waves passing through the gap the diffraction is happening and diffraction will happen maximum when gap width is same as the wavelength so here the gap width and wavelength are same so we are getting maximum diffraction in this case but later they increased the gap size so what will happen to the amount of diffraction or what can be observed so when the gap width increased the wavelength will be smaller comparing to the gap width so the diffraction amount won't be maximum that means in this case the amount of diffraction will reduce so which will cause a less diffraction less diffraction means less curve so the correct answer is option d the ripples are less curved question 18 the diagram shows a wave which row correctly indicates the amplitude and the wavelength of the wave so the amplitude is nothing but the highest displacement from the mean position so distance between 1 and 2 or distance between 2 and 3 represents amplitude so we can say distance between 1 and 2 represent amplitude so the correct answer will be either 1 or 2 c and d are wrong answer now let's look at the wavelength in option a it says that the wavelength is a distance between 4 and 5 let's look at the figure again in option a it says wavelength is the distance between 4 and 5 no that is wrong this is only the half of the wavelength so option a is not correct option b says the distance between 4 and 6 so the distance between 4 and 6 and that is correct this is the length of one complete wave and that is nothing but wavelength so the correct answer is option b question 19 two beams of light are both the same color of red the beam is traveling through air the other beam is traveling through water each beam has a different brightness which quantity is the same for both sets of wave and that is nothing but frequency because frequency is not going to change when the medium change for a light its wavelength and speed will change frequency will remain always same frequency means nothing but the color also same the color represents frequency and it still remain red so the correct answer is option b or you need to understand when the medium changes the electromagnetic waves speed and wavelength will change frequency will always remain same question 20 the diagram shows a ray of light in air incident on a glass block some of the light is refracted and some of the light is reflected two angles p and q are marked on the diagram which row gives an angle of incidence and state whether the total internal reflection occurs so angle of incidence is the angle between the incident light and the normal therefore q is the angle of incidence that means correct answer will be either c or d now let's check about the total internal reflection as the name indicates total internal reflection means all the rays will reflected back but in this case all the rays are not reflecting back you can see some of the rays are refracting so total internal reflection is not occurring therefore the correct answer is option c question 21 the diagram shows a ray of light in glass incident on the surface between the glass and air what happens if the angle of incidence is made larger than the critical angle for this glass so here the ray is passing 
from a denser medium to rarer from glass to air so high density medium to low density medium that means when this ray incidence when the angle of incidence is more than the critical angle total internal reflection will happen so this incident ray will reflect back so we can say there is only a ray reflected inside the glass itself therefore the correct answer is option d and this is nothing but total internal reflection option a says the angle of refraction becomes equal to 90 degree which will happen when the angle of incidence is equal to critical angle but it, here it is not equal but it is larger than so the correct answer is only option d question 22 the sun emits infrared radiation and light light from sun reaches the earth in 8 minutes which row gives correct information about infrared radiation option a says the wavelength of infrared radiation is longer than the wavelength of light which is correct you have to memorize the range of wavelength for all electromagnetic waves so you can identify this statement is correct and time taken for the infrared radiation to reach earth is 8 minutes that is also correct even though their wavelength is different both are electromagnetic waves and speed of electromagnetic wave whether it is gamma or light rays or infrared or radio waves its speed all constant which is 3 times 10 to the power 8 meter per second so same speed means it will take same time therefore the correct answer is option a question 23 which list shows regions of electromagnetic spectrum in order of increasing frequency in order to answer this question you have to memorize the electromagnetic spectrum here increasing frequency so the correct answer is infrared visible light ultraviolet and x ray here the frequency is increasing therefore the correct answer is option c question 24 what is ultrasound ultrasound is nothing but sound wave but its frequency is greater than audible range so this is the more important point about ultrasound its frequency will be greater than audible range audible range means 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz so the ultrasounds frequency will be always greater than 20 kilohertz and when the frequency is greater means pitch will be greater because pitch and frequency are related the more pitch means the more frequency hence the correct answer is option b it is a sound wave that are too high pitched too high pitched means too high frequency for human to hear yes human cannot hear as its frequency range is greater than the audible range therefore the correct answer is option b question 25 an uncharged metal sphere is placed on an insulating support a positively charged rod is brought close to the sphere but does not touch it how do the charge in the sphere move and what is now the charge on the sphere so here we can see as opposite charge is attracted the negative charges will accumulate at the right side of the sphere because it will be attracted to the rod which is positively charged so the other side will become positive so the option a says negative charges move to the right of the sphere we have seen negative charges are moving to the right of the sphere yes negative charges will move to the right side of the sphere so the option a and b first part is correct in option c it states that positive charge moves to the left of the sphere positive charge cannot move only negative charge that is free electrons can move so this statement is wrong you have to understand positive charges that is nothing but protons they cannot move they will be only residing inside the nucleus 
so positive charges will never move it's only electrons or negative charges move now second column is about charge on the sphere what is a charge on the sphere still there is equal number of negative charges and equal number of positive charges only negative charges accumulated at right hand side and positive charges accumulate at the left side of the sphere but the total number of negative and positive charge still remains same so the total charge will be zero or neutral therefore the correct answer is option b question 26 in which circuit is the ammeter measuring the flow of charge through the lamp ammeter should connect in series with the circuit so the correct answer is option d where ammeter has kept in series with the lamp so the ammeter will read what is the current flow through the circuit the same current will be passing through the lamp also so the correct answer is option b always ammeter should connect in series and voltmeter should connect parallel or across that component question 27 a lamp is connected to a cell so we have lamp and cell in each options which circuit diagram shows the direction of conventional current i and also the direction of the flow of electrons so the electrons will always flow from the negative side of the battery to the positive side but the conventional current we are considering as the opposite direction of the flow of electron so always conventional current moving from positive side of the battery or a cell to the negative side of a cell therefore in option c it shows the conventional current direction is from positive side to negative side as the direction pointing in that way likewise when we look at the direction of flow of electrons we can see as electron is moving in this direction it indicates the electrons are moving from negative side to positive side therefore option c satisfies both the conditions hence the correct answer is option c question 28 the diagram shows a circuit containing two resistors of resistance 1 ohm and 2 ohm a voltmeter is connected across 1 ohm resistor by connecting p to x the reading on the voltmeter is 6 volt p is moved to point y in the circuit what is the new reading on the voltmeter so initially the p connected to x at that time the reading of voltmeter was 6 volt that means potential difference across 1 ohm resistor is 6 volt at this time then the potential difference across 2 ohm resistor will be double because the resistor is double means it will consume double energy or the potential difference will also be double so as for 1 ohm resistor it consumes 6 volt potential difference for 2 ohm resistor it will be 12 volt that means the total emf of this circuit is 6 volt plus 12 volt or the total voltage produced for this circuit by the cell must be 18 volt now when this voltmeter connects across y or p connected to the y the voltmeter read the total voltage across both the resistors so 6 plus 12 that is 18 volt therefore the correct answer is option d question 29 the graph shows the current voltage relationship for a circuit component x what happens to the resistance of x and what happens to the temperature of x as the voltage increases so from current voltage graph we have to identify what happens to the resistor so here we can use ohm's law that v is equal to ir from this resistor is equal to voltage over current 
then we can take the reciprocal of this equation at both side so we can understand that 1 over resistance is i over voltage and now look at this graph and what is the gradient of the graph gradient is nothing but slope and that is the change in y over change in x here change in y is current value over change in x is voltage so we will get the gradient of the graph is nothing but i over v and we already derived the relation i over voltage is nothing but reciprocal of resistance so we can identify the gradient of this graph gives you an idea of reciprocal of the resistance and let's see what happens to the gradient or slope it is clear that the gradient is keep increasing or the slope is increasing so slope of this graph is increases when the voltage increases that means 1 over r is increases when 1 over r increases r must be decreases because r is residing at the denominator so we should understand resistance must be increasing sorry decreasing 1 over resistor is increasing so the resistor must be decreasing so we can write the resistance must be decreasing either the answer will be a or b and when resistor decreases what is the reason of that it must be because when the temperature increases for a thermistor it resistance will decrease so the correct answer is option b question 30 the diagrams show a pair of circuits containing logic gates in which diagram does the lower circuit of the pair behave differently from the upper circuit? Let's study the two table of each logic gate. So for option A, when input is 0, the output will be 1. When input is 1, the output will be 0. For the second logic gate given in option A, when input is 0, both sides it will be 0, 0. So the output for a NAND gate will be 1. Likewise, when input is 1, at both input it will be 1, 1 and therefore the output will be 0. So we can see both logic gates have the same function like when we give 0 input, output is 1 for both. When we give 1 input, the output is 0 for both the logic gates so option a is not giving a different behavior so option a is not correct answer let's look at option b the first one is an AND gate and its true table is when inputs if it's a and b the output values for 0 0 it will be 0 for 0 1 it will be again 0 for 1 0 again 0 only for 1 1 we will get a 1 value we can see what will be the output for the second combination of logic gates the initial option 0 0 so when we give 0 0 since it is a NAND gate the output will be just opposite of an AND gate so the output must be 1 therefore the inputs of the second NAND gate will be 1, 1. So the output is 0. Therefore, when we give 0, 0 as the input, output is 0. So 0, 0, the output is 0. So here also we can see even when the input 0, 0, the output is getting 0 for both logic gates. So they are not showing a different behavior. So option B is also not correct answer. We don't have to look at other options because in the question it's mentioned it should behave differently. But here even for the first pair of inputs they are not behaving differently. So option B is also not correct answer. Let's look at option C. So we have the OR gate true table. So when we give 0 0 at the input 0 will be the output. Other possible inputs are 0, 1, 1, 0 and 1, 1. For all these values, output will be 1. 
Now let's look at for the second logic gate in the same option. We can start with the first input possible input that is 0 0 and we know that the output will be 1 since it is a NOR gate. Now this one we are connecting to the input of a NAND gate and the output of a NAND gate when both inputs are 1 1 will be 0. So here we can see when both inputs are 0 the output is 0 same like the output of the OR gate when both inputs are 0 the output is 0. So for option C also we are not getting an answer or an output which is different from first and second logic gate. So the only option is remaining is option D so that will be the correct answer and you can check if you check you will not get the same outputs for both the logic gates. Question number 31 in which circuit do both lamps light? So in this circuit we have a battery, diode and two lamps. So here the most important point we should know is that when a diode connected to a cell or a battery the positive side of the cell should connect the positive side of the diode and negative side of the diode should connect the negative side of the cell. So here you can see the positive side of the cell connected to the positive side of the diode and negative side of the diode connected to the negative side of the cell then only it will the circuit will conduct electricity. If a diode is connected in reverse bias ring or in opposite way that I will just show here now. Here you can see the positive side of a cell is connected to the negative side of the diode. So in this case diode is called reverse biased and there won't be no current flowing or the diode block the current flow. So we have to make sure always the connection should be positive side of the cell to the positive side of the diode or negative side of the cell to the negative side of the diode. Now we can look at each option. In option A the positive side of the cell is connected to the negative side of the diode. So this diode will block the current as it is reverse biased. Therefore there won't be no current in this circuit. No current will be flowing through the circuit. In option B again we can see the negative side of the cell connected to the positive side of the diode. So again here it is reverse biased therefore no current will be flowing through circuit B. In option C we can see the positive side of the cell connected to the positive side of the diode and negative side is connected to the negative side of the cell so that there will be a current flow through this loop hence the first lamp will light up likewise the current will flow through the second loop also and second lamp will also light up. Therefore the correct answer is option C. Question 32. Two resistors with resistances R1 and R2 are connected in parallel. The resistance R1 is greater than the resistance R2. What is the resistance of parallel combination? So here we have two resistors they are connected in parallel. So when we check the parallel combination the combined resistance will be always less than either R1 and or R2. So the correct answer is option A. Question 33 the metal cases of electrical appliances are connected to an earth wire which statement is not correct. Option A says the live wire may become loose and touch the metal case. Yes, so in such cases to prevent electric shock we can connect to an earth wire. Option B says if the metal case becomes live the earth wire conducts the current to the ground. That is also correct. The purpose of connecting earth wire is to conduct the excess 
current to the ground. Option C says the earth wire needs to have high resistance. That is not correct. If the resistance of this earth wire is very high means there won't be no current able to flow. So the purpose of earth wire will not happen. Option D says earthing metal cases help prevent a person from receiving an electric shock. Yes, that is a correct statement. Therefore, the correct answer that means a wrong statement is option C. Question 34. What is the function of the split ring commutator in an electric motor with a single rotating coil? The function is to reverse the current in the coil whenever its plane becomes perpendicular to the magnetic field. Therefore, the correct answer is option C. Question 35. Which graph represents an alternating current? So, an alternating current is the current which will have both positive and negative values which will keep altering. So, in option B we can see even though the values of the current changing, all the values of the current is in positive cycle. So, there is only positive values that means it is not AC but a fluctuating DC. And option C we can see positive value and a constant value. So, option C is also representing a steady DC and option D is showing a current which is having only negative value. So, throughout its value is negative, it is not alterating from negative to positive and positive to negative. So, all these currents are DC. So, only the correct answer is option A. As you can see, it has both positive cycle and negative cycle. Again, positive, negative. So, the direction of the current changes and that is AC current. Hence, the correct answer is option A. Question 36. The diagrams show a horizontal wire in a magnetic field. The horizontal wire is firmly held at each end, not shown and cannot move. The magnets and holder are on a balance. When there is no current in the wire, the reading on the balance is 0 0.35 gram. There is a DC current in the wire as shown. What happens to the reading on the balance? So, in this question, we have kept a metal wire in between a magnetic field and the magnetic field direction is always from north pole to south pole. So, there is a magnetic field from north pole to south pole and a current carrying conductor with a current flowing as we can see out of the page. Therefore, we know that due to motor effect, when there is a magnetic field and a current in a conductor, there will be a force exerting on this conductor. And we can find what will be the direction of this force acting on the wire using Fleming's left hand rule since it is motor effect that is electricity already there the force is the product we should use Fleming's left hand rule. So, when we apply Fleming's left hand rule the third finger should point towards the direction of current and which is out of the page or which should point towards our face. And the second finger should point in the direction of the magnetic field. Then we can check what is the direction of thumb, which will give us an idea about the direction of the force. So, here the second finger that indicates the direction of magnetic field, which we know that it is pointing towards the right. So, the second finger should point towards right. And the third finger should point towards your face or out of the page. Then we can see the direction of the thumb is upwards. 
so from this we should identify or understand that there is an upward force acting on this metal wire using fleming's left hand rule we can understand that the force acting on the metal wire is upward when there is a force acting upward due to motor effect according to newton's third law we know that there will be an equal but opposite force which will be acting downward this is known as reaction force or newton's pair of force so there will be an equal force acting in opposite direction so we can see that other than the weight of this system or this magnet there is one additional force is also acting on this balance so the new reading will be something greater than 0.35 gram hence the correct answer is option d larger than 0.35 gram the reading will be larger when there is a current flowing in the conductor in the given direction question 37 the nucleus of an americium atom contains 146 neutrons and 95 protons it decays by emitting an alpha particles how many neutrons and how many protons remain in the nucleus when it forms an americium decay so we have an element americium when it decays an alpha particles an alpha particle has a proton number 2 and a mass number 4 so along with this we will get a new product let it be x so here the for this americium atom the atomic number is nothing but the number of proton is 95 and mass number is the number of protons plus neutron that is 95 plus 146 is equal to 241 so at the lhs of the equation we have the proton number that is 95 and mass number 241 but from this an alpha particle decays or there is a loss of 2 in proton number and 4 in mass number so the remaining will be 95 minus 2 that is 93 and 241 minus 4 because the rhs and lhs the equations or the mass and atomic number should be balanced so we will get 237 so for this element or for this new element we can identify that number of proton is 93 and number of neutron we can calculate by subtracting the mass number minus number of proton and the mass number here we have 237 so we can subtract 237 minus proton number which is 93 and the answer is 144 so the remaining proton number is 93 and neutron number is 144 therefore the correct answer is c question 38 the graph shows how the count rate measured by a radio activity detector placed near a radioactive sample changed with time given that the background count rate is 30 count per minute what is the half life of this sample so initially when time t is equal to 0 the count rate is 530 that means by subtracting the background radiation which is 30 we will get when time t is equal to 0 the count rate is 530 minus background radiation that is 500 so after half life the count rate must be half of 500 that must be Half of five hundred is two hundred and fifty, but 
we have to consider the background radiation also at this time therefore the count rate after half life will be 250 plus background radiation background radiation will always remain constant and that is 30 so we will get 280 now we can check at which point from the graph we will get a count rate that is 280 and at this point so we can find what is the time taken or corresponding time value on the x-axis by extending the graph from the value on y that is 280 to the x-axis and this represent 3.4 hours therefore the correct answer is option a 3.4 hours question 39 a teacher holds a radioactive source near a detector the reading on the detector is 320 counts per minute the detector is switched on again after the source has been removed and it shows a reading of 20 counts per minute what is the count per minute solely due to the source and what is there a reading on the detector when there is no radioactive source present so the reading on the re detector when there is no radioactive sample is only because of the background radiation therefore the reason for reading with no source is due to the background radiation not zero error on the detector next we can look at the count per minute due to the source so here we can identify 20 count per minute was the reading when there were no radioactive sample so this must be the background radiation which will always present now the total count rate including the background radiation and from the source is 320 so from this we can find out what will be the count due to the source which will be the total count minus background radiation which is 20 so we will get 300 so 300 counts per minute must be the count rate from the source therefore the correct answer is option b question 40 which statement is not correct alpha particles are used to detect cracks in metallic structures so the first statement itself wrong it's not alpha particles but gamma rays are used to detect the cracks in metallic structures so the correct answer is option a that statement is not correct thank you for watching this video if you find this video useful please like this video and subscribe my channel thank you